Uh, hello? It's me. Uh... So I've, uh, got a, uh... I'm, I'm sitting here and I can't really see the comments on the chat. I have it on a TV behind me so I can see that. Uh, but yeah, we're going to read this book right here, which is, uh, you can't see it because I'm sitting in front of it. Uh, it's this one. It's called, uh, Enter a Murderer. And the author is Nio Marsh. Uh, Nio Marsh is from New Zealand. Uh, she was one of the, one of the, uh, most famous mystery writers of that time. Slightly less famous than uh, Dorothy Sayers, who was much less famous than Agatha Christie. But not much less. Okay, I don't want to get into that. But uh, they were three murder mystery writers, and I like all of them. And uh, I like Nio Marsh a lot. And I'm going to read some of this book because I don't know what else to do. Because, uh, oh, is there a problem with the audio? I need to make sure the audio sounds good. I don't know how to view it on my uh, phone. Oh, my God. Hold on. YouTube doesn't really make it easy to... Uh, Yeah, the YouTube phone app will not let me see this. God dang it. Come on, man. Hold on. I need to hear what my audio sounds like. Well, it looks like I can hear it. Well, it looks like... Oh, it doesn't sound bad. What What is with people trying to tell me there's something wrong with it? There's nothing wrong. God dang it. People in god darn stream chats are always saying your thing sounds wrong. It doesn't sound wrong, god darn it. There's nothing wrong with it. Man, I don't know. Maybe you got it open in two windows. Maybe I got it open in two windows. I don't know. So this is the uh, this is the book, and I suppose I'm going to start reading it, just because uh, I got nothing else to do right now, and uh, I was going to reread this book anyway. And I've got this camera sitting right here, and uh, you know how it is. You know. God dang it, Dylan Schneider, lol, it was my mistake, it was playing on Twitter as well. Don't make that mistake. Come on, man. I don't know, do whatever you want. Okay, well, I guess I should uh, uh, read the uh, back of the book, because it's really fun to look at the back of the book here. So this, this book was originally published in 1935, and this edition is... First paperback edition, 1941, July 1941. So, um, this is a really stupid book. Well, it's not stupid. Um, anyway, so I'm going to read the back of the book. Introducing a new mystery mistress to pocketbook sleuths. Entered Nio Marsh into the Hall of Fame of pocketbook mystery masterpieces with Enter a Murderer. And as one critic puts it, this peeress of perplexing puzzlers has... Dorothy Sayers and Agatha Christie, wondering if their crowns are on straight. Enter a Murderer is brand new to American mystery addicts. It has never before been published in an American edition, and it has every Nio Marsh quality of story, humor, character, and grim situation, uh, including agreeable Inspector Allen of the CID that won her the praise of her readers, her critics and her fellow authors alike in books like A Man Lay Dead, Death at the Bar, Death of a Peer, and others. Incidentally, 
Nayo is pronounced Nayo. I like that. I'm telling you how to pronounce the author's name. Proclaiming Miss Marsh's New Zealand extraction. She was successively a painter, playwright, actress, stage manager, and interior decorator before she turned to the production of top-notch whodunits. You will pronounce Enter a Murderer nigh perfect. I like that they used to give you a little bio of the author on the back of the book and tell you what other jobs they had had before they started writing books. I find that interesting. So this is actually her second book in her Inspector Elaine. Elaine uh, was never really sure what the pronunciation was supposed to be. Uh, uh, this is the second in that series, and a lot of these have theatrical plays as a theme, so you can find out that much if you're looking her up on Wikipedia right now, which you can very well do. Um, so, no intro of any kind. The book just starts. I love that. So here it is. Uh, chapter one, prologue to a play. On May 25th, Arthur Sir Bonadier, whose real name was Arthur Seams, went to visit his uncle, Jacob Saint, whose real name was Jacob Seams. Jacob was an actor before he went into management and had chosen Saint as his stage name and stuck to it for the rest of his life. He made bad jokes about it, I'm no saint, and wouldn't allow his nephew to adopt it when he in turn took to the boards. Only one saint in the profession, he roared out. Call yourself what you like, Arthur, but keep off my grass. I'll start you off at the unicorn, and I'll leave you the cash, or most of it. If you're a bad actor, you won't get the parts. That's business. As Arthur Surbonadier, Surbonadier had been suggested by Stephanie Vaughn, walked after the footman towards his uncle's library, he remembered this conversation. He was not a bad actor. He was an adequate actor. He was, he told himself, a darn good actor. He tried to stiffen himself to the encounter. A darn good actor with personality. He would dominate Jacob Saint. He would, if necessary, use that final weapon, the weapon that Saint knew nothing about. The footman opened the library door. Mr. Surbonadier, sir. Arthur Surbonadier walked in. Jacob Saint was sitting at his ultra-modern desk in his ultra-modern chair. A cubistic lamp lit up the tight rolls of fat at the back of his neck. His gray and white checkered jacket revealed the muscles of his back. His face was turned away from Sieur Bonadier. Wreaths of cigar smoke rose above his pink head. The room smelt of cigar smoke and the scent he used. It was specifically made for him, that scent, and none of his ladies, not even Janet Emerald, had ever been given a flask of it. Sit down, Arthur, he rumbled. Have a cigar. I'll talk to you in a moment. Arthur Siobonadier sat down, refused the cigar, lit a cigarette, and fidgeted. Jacob Saint wrote, grunted, thumped a blotter, and swung round in his steel chair. He was like a cartoon of a theater magnate. He was as if he played his own character, with his enormous red dewlaps, his coarse voice, his light blue eyes and his thick lips. What do you want, Arthur? He said and waited. How are you, Uncle Jacob? Rheumatism better? It isn't rheumatism, it's gout and it's bloody. What do you want? It's about the new show at the Unicorn, Sir Bonadier hesitated and again Saint waited. I, I know if you've, I, I don't know if you've seen the change in the casting. I have. Oh, well? Well, said Sir Bonadier, with a desperate attempt at lightness. Do you approve of it, uncle? I do. I don't. What the heck does that matter? Asked Jacob Saint. Sir Bonadier's heavy face whitened. He tried to act the part of himself, dominant, himself in control of the stage. Mentally, he fingered his weapon. Originally, he said, I was cast for Carruthers. I can play the part and play it well. Now it's been given to Gardiner, to Master Felix, whom everybody loves so much, whom Stephanie Vaughan loves so much. That doesn't arise, said Sir Bonadier. His lips trembled. With a kind of miserable exultation, he felt his anger welling up. Don't be childish, Arthur, rumbled Saint. 
Don't come whining to me. Felix Gardiner plays Carruthers because he is a better actor than you are. He probably gets Stephanie Vaughn for the same reason. He's got more sex appeal. You're cast for the beaver. It's a very showy part, and they've taken it away from old Barclay Crammer, who would have done it well enough. I tell you, I'm not satisfied. I want you to make the alteration. I want Carruthers. You won't get it. I told you before you'd ever faced the foots that our relationship was not going to be used in, used to jack you up into star parts. I gave you your chance, and you wouldn't have got that if I wasn't your uncle. Now it's up to you. He stared dully at his nephew, and then swung his chair towards the desk. I'm busy, he added. Sir Bonadier wetted his lips and crossed to him. You've bullied me, he said, all my life. You paid for my education because it suited your vanity to do it and because you like power. Spoken deliberately, comes downstage slowly, quite the little actor, aren't you? You've got to get rid of Felix Gardiner. Jacob Saint, for the first time, gave his nephew his whole attention. His eyes protruded slightly. He thrust his head forward. It was a trick that was strangely disconcerting and had served him well when dealing with harder men than Sir Bonadier. Try that line of talk again, he said very quietly, and you're finished. Now get out. Not yet. Sir Bonadier gripped the top of the desk and cleared his throat. I know too much about you, he said at last, more than you realize. I know why you, why you paid Mortlake 2,000. They stared at each other. A dribble of cigar smoke escaped through Saint's half-open lips. When he spoke, it was with venomous restraint. So we thought we'd try an old spot of blackmail, did we? His voice had thickened. What have you been doing, you? Did you never miss a letter you had from him last February when, when I was, when you were my guest? By God, my money's been well spent on you, Arthur. Here's a copy. Sir Bonadier's shaking hand went to his pocket. He could not take his eyes off Saint. There was something automaton-like about him. Saint glanced at the paper and dropped it. If there's any more of this, his voice rose to a shocking, raucous yell. I'll have you up for blackmail. I'll ruin you. You'll never get another shop in London. You hear that? I'll do it. Sir Bonadier backed away, actually as though he feared he would be attacked. I'll do it. His hand was on the door. Jacob Saint stood up. He was six feet tall and enormous. He should have dominated the room. He was much the better animal of the two. Yet Sir Bonadier, unhealthy, unhealthy, too soft and shaking visibly, had about him an air of sneaking mastery. I'm off, he said. No, said Saint. No, sit down again. I'll talk. Sir Bonadier went back to, the, to his chair. On the night of June 7th, after the first performance of The Rat and the Beaver, Felix Gardiner gave a party in his flat in Sloane Street. He had invited all the other members of the cast, even old Susan Max, who got buccaneerish over the champagne and talked about the parts she had played with Julius Knight in Australia. Janet Emerald, the heavy of the play, listened to her with an air of gloomy profundity. Stephanie Vaughan was very much the leading lady, very tranquil, very gracious, carelessly kind to everyone and obviously pliant to Felix Gardiner himself. Nigel Bathgate, the only journalist at the party and an old Cambridge friend of Felix, wondered if he and Miss Vaughan were about to announce their engagement. Surely their mutual attentiveness meant something more than mere theatrical effusion. Arthur Subonadier was there, rather too friendly with everybody, thought Nigel, who disliked him. And J. Barclay Crammer, who disliked him even more, glared at Sir Bonadier across the table. Dulcie Deemer, the, was, uh, what? Uh, oh, and Howard Melville ran a good second in registering youthful charm, youthful bashfulness, and something else that was genuinely youthful and rather pleasing. Jacob Saint was there, loudly jovial and jovially loud. My company, my actors, my show, he seemed to shout continually, and indeed did. To the playwright, who was present and submissive, Saint actually referred as my author. The playwright remained submissive. Even George Simpson, the stage manager, was present, and it was he who began the conversation that Nigel was to recall a few weeks later and relate to his friend, Detective Inspector Allen. 
The business with the gun went off all right, Felix S Simpson said, though I must say I was nervous about it. I have a fake. Was it all right from the front? asked Le Bonadier, turning to Nigel Badgate. What do you mean? asked Nigel. What, what business with the gun? My God, he doesn't even remember it, sighed Felix Gardiner. In the third act, my dear chap, I, I shoot the beaver. Arthur, Mr. Silbonadier, close range, and he falls down dead. Of course I remember that, said Nigel, rather nettled. It was perfectly all right, most convincing. The gun went off. The gun went off, screamed Miss Dulcie Deemer hilariously. Did you hear him, Felix? The gun didn't go off, said the stage manager. That's just the point. I fire another off in the prompt corner, and... Felix jerks his hand. You see, he shoots the beaver at close range. Actually, presses the barrel of the revolver into his waistcoat, so we, we can't use a blank. It, it would scorch his clothes. The cartridges that the beaver loads his gun with are all duds, empty shells. I'm darned glad you don't, said Arthur Subonadier. I loathe guns, and I sweat blood in that scene. The price one pays, he added heavily, for being an actor. He glanced at his uncle, Jacob Saint. Oh, for heaven's sake muttered J. Barclay Crammer in a bitterly scornful aside to Gardiner. It's your own gun, isn't it, Felix? He said aloud. Yes, said Felix Gardiner. It was my brother's. Went all through Flanders with him. His voice deepened. I'm not leaving it at the theater. Too precious. Here it is. A little silence fell upon the company as he produced a service revolver. He laid it on the table. It makes the play seem rather paltry, said the author of the play. They spoke no more of the gun. On the morning of June 14th, when the rat and the beaver had run a week to full houses, Felix Gardiner sent Nigel Bathgate two complimentary tickets for the stalls. Angela North, who does not come into this story, was away from London, so Nigel rang up Scotland Yard and asked for his friend, Chief Detective Inspector Allen. Are you doing anything tonight? He said. What do you want me to do? Said the voice in the receiver. How cautious you are, said Nigel. I've got a couple of seats for the show at the Unicorn. Felix Gardiner gave them to me. You do know a lot of exciting people, remarked the inspector. I'll come with pleasure. Dine with me first, won't you? You'll, you dine with me. It's my party. Really? This promise is well. That's splendid, said Nigel. I'll pick you up at a quarter to seven. Right you are. I'm due for a night off, said the voice. Thank you, Bathgate. Goodbye. Hope you enjoy it, said Nigel, but the receiver had gone dead. At cocktail time on the same day, June 14th, Arthur Surbonadier had called Miss Stephanie Vaughan at her flat in Shepherd's Market and asked her to marry him. It was not the first time he had done so. Miss Vaughan felt herself called upon to use all her professional and personal savoir-faire. The scene needed some handling, and she gave it her full attention. Darling, she said, taking her time over lighting a cigarette and quite unconsciously adopting the best of her six by the mantelpiece poses. Darling, I'm so terribly, terribly upset by all this. I feel I'm to blame. I am to blame. Sir Bonadier was silent. Miss Vaughan changed her pose. He knew quite well through long experience what her next pose would be, and equally well that it would charm him as though he were watching her for the first time. Her voice would drop. She would purr. She did purr. Arthur, darling, I'm all nervy. This piece, has, this piece has exhausted my vitality. I don't know where I am. You must be patient with me. I feel I'm incapable of loving anybody. She let her arms fall limply to her sides and then laid one hand delicately for him to look at. Quite incapable, she added on a drifting sigh. Even of loving Felix Gardiner, said Sir Bonadier. Ah, Felix. Miss Vaughan gave her famous three-cornered smile, lifted her shoulders a little, looked meditative and resigned. She managed to convey a world of something or another quite beyond her control. It comes to this, said Sue Bonadier. Has Gardiner... He paused and looked away from her. Has Gardiner cut me out? My sweet, what an Edwardianism. Felix talks one of my languages. You talk another. I wish to God, said Sir Bonadier, that you would confine yourself to plain English. I can talk that as well as he. I love you. I want you. Does that come into any of your languages? Miss Vaughan sank into a chair and clasped her hands. 
Arthur, she said, I must have my freedom. It can't be closed in emotionally. Felix gives me something. The heck he does, said Sir Bonadier. He too sat down, as, and as such was the habit of the stage. He sat down rather stagily. His hands shook with genuine emotion, though, and Stephanie Vaughan eyed him and knew it. Arthur, she said, you must forgive me, darling. I'm very attached to you, and I hate hurting you, but if you can, leave off wanting me. Don't ask me to marry you. I might say yes and make you even more unhappy than you are now. Even while she spoke, she knew she had made a false step. He had moved quickly to her side and taken her in his arms. I'd risk the unhappiness, he muttered. I want you so much. He pressed his face into her neck. She shivered a little. Unseen by him, her face expressed a kind of exultant disgust. Her hands were on his hair. Suddenly she thrust him away. No, 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 she said. Don't. Leave me alone. Can't you see I'm sick of it all? Leave me alone. In all the bad men parts he had played, Sir Bonadier had never looked quite so evil as he did at that moment. I'll be darned if I'll leave you alone, he said. I'm not going to be kicked out. I don't care if you hate me. I want you, and by God, I'll have you. He took her by the wrists. She did not attempt to resist him. They stared, full of antagonism, into each other's faces. Distantly, an electric bell sounded, and at once her moment of surrender, as if it had been a moment of surrender, was passed. That's the front door, she said. Let me go, Arthur. She had to struggle before she could break away from him, and he was still beside her in a state of rather blatant agitation when Felix Gardner walked into the room. Chapter 2 Overture and Beginners, Please The stage doorkeeper of the unicorn glanced up at the grimy face of the clock, 710. All the artists were snug in their dressing rooms now, all that was except old Susan Max, who played an insignificant part in the last act and was given a bit of license by the stage manager. Susan usually came in about eight. Footsteps sounded in the alley outside. Old Blair uttered a kind of groaning sigh peculiar to himself, got creakily off his stool, and peered out into the warmish air. In a moment, two men in evening dress stepped into the pool of uncertain light cast by the stage door lamp. Blair moved into the doorway and looked at them in silence. Good evening, said the shorter of the two men. Evening, sir, said Blair, and waited. Can we see Mr. Gardner, do you think? He's expecting us. Mr. Bathgate. He opened a cigarette case and produced a card. Old Blair took it and shifted his gaze to the taller of the two visitors. Mr. Allen is with me, said Nigel Bathgate. Will you wait a moment, please, said Blair, and, holding the card in the palm of his hand as if he were rather ashamed of it, he walked off down the passage. That old gentleman had a good look at you, said Nigel Bathgate. He offered his cigarette case. Perhaps he knew me, said Chief Detective Inspector Allen. I'm as famous as anything, you know. Are you now? Too famous, perhaps, to be amused at this sort of thing? Nigel waved his cigarette in the direction of the passage. Not a bit. I'm as simple as I am clever, a lovable trait in my character. An actor in his dressing room will thrill, you to, thrill me to mincemeat. I shall sit and goggle at him, I promise you. Felix is more likely to goggle at you. When he gave me a couple of stalls for tonight, I told him Angela couldn't come and... I mean, said Nigel hurriedly... I said I'd ask you, and he was quite startled by the importance of me. So he ought to be, all took aback. When your best girl's away, ask a policeman. A sensible man, Felix Gardner, as well as a darn good actor. And I do love a crook play, I do. Oh, said Nigel, I never thought of that. Rather a busman's holiday for you, I'm afraid. Not it. It is the sort where you have to guess the murderer. It is. And you'll look a bit silly if you can't, won't you, Inspector? Shut up. I shall bribe this old gentleman to tell me. Here he comes. Old Blair appeared at the end of the passage. Will you come this way, please, he said, without returning to the door. Nigel and Alan stepped inside the stage door of the unicorn, and at the precise moment, Chief Detective Inspector Alan all unknowingly walked into one of the toughest jobs of his career. They at once sensed the indescribable flavor of the working half of a theater, 
when the nightly show is coming on. The stage door opens into a little realm, strange or unfamiliar, but always apart and shut in. The passage led directly onto the stage, which was dimly lit and smelled of dead scene paint, of fresh grease paint, of glue size, and of dusty darkness. Time out of mind, the incense of the playhouse. A pack of scenes, flats, again leaned against the wall, and a fireman leaned against the outer flap, which was painted to represent a section of a bookcase. A man in shirt sleeves and rubber-soled shoes ran distractedly, round the back of the set. A boy carrying a bouquet of sweet peas disappeared into a brightly lit entry on the right. The flats of the set vanished up into an opalescent haze. Beyond them, lit by shaded lamps, the furniture of a library mutely faced to the reverse side of the curtain. From behind the curtain came the disturbing and profoundly exciting murmur of the audience and the immemorial squall of tuning fiddle strings. Through the prompt entrance, another man in shirt sleeves stared into the flies. What are you doing with those bloody blues? He inquired. His voice was deadened by carpets and furniture. Someone far above answered. A switch clicked and the set was suddenly illuminated. A pair of feet appeared above Nigel's face. He looked up and saw dimly the electrician's platform on which one man stood with his hand on the switchboard and another sat dangling his legs. That's George Simpson, the stage manager, whispered Nigel importantly. Old Blair knocked on the second door. There was a pause and then a pleasant baritone voice called. Hello, who is it? Blair opened the door two inches and said, the visitors, Mr. Gardner. What, oh yes, half a second called the voice, and then to someone inside. Quite agree with you, old boy, but what can you do? No, don't go. A chair scraped, and in a moment the door was opened. Come in, come in, said Felix Gardner. They crossed the threshold, and Inspector Allen found himself, for the first time in his life, in an actor's dressing room and shaking hands with the actor. Felix Gardner was not a preposterously good-looking man, not, that is to say, so handsome that the male section of his audience longed at times to give him a kick in the pants. He had, however, the elusive quality of distinction. His straw-colored hair was thick and lay sleekly on his neatly shaped head. His eyes, scarcely the width of an eye apart, were surprisingly blue, his nose straight and narrow. His mouth, generously large and curiously folded in at the corners, was a joy to newspaper cartoonists. His jawline was simply marked, giving emphasis to a face otherwise rather fine-drawn. He was tall, carried himself beautifully, but not too much like a showman, and he had a really delightful speaking voice, light but resonant. He was said by women to have it, by men to be a very decent fellow, and by critics to be an actor of outstanding ability. I'm so glad you've come round, he said to Alan. Do sit down. Oh, May I introduce Mr. Barclay Crammer? Mr. Allen, Bathgate you've met. J. Barclay Crammer was a character actor. He was just sufficiently well known for people to say, who is that man, when he walked onto the stage, and not quite distinctive enough for them to bother to look him up in the program. He was dark, full-faced, and a good character actor. He looked bad-tempered, thought Nigel, who had met him once before at Gardner's first night supper party. Can you all find somewhere to sit? asked Gardner. He seated himself in front of his dressing table. Alan and Nigel found a couple of armchairs. The room was a blaze of lights and extremely warm. A gas jet protected by an open cage bubbled above the dressing table on which stood a mirror and all the paraphernalia of makeup. The room smelled of grease paint. Near the mirror lay a revolver and a pipe. A full-length glass hung on the, on the right-hand wall by a wash basin. On the left-hand wall was a looped-up sheet of half-covered a collection of suits. Through the wall came the sound of women's voices in the star room. So glad you've both come, Nigel, said Gardner. I never see you nowadays. You journalists are devilish hard to get hold of. No more elusive than you actors, rejoined Nigel. Not half as slippery as the police. 
I may tell you it's rather a feather in my cap producing Alan tonight. I know, agreed Gardner, turning to his mirror and dabbing his face with brown powder. It makes me quite nervous. Do you realize, J.B., that Mr. Allen is a kingpin in the C.I.D.? Really? Intoned Mr. Barclay Crammer deeply. He hesitated a moment and then added with rather ponderous gaiety. Makes me even more nervous as I'm one of the villains of the piece. A very, very minor villain, he added with unmistakable bitterness. Now don't tell me you're the murderer, said Allen. It would ruin my evening. Nothing so important, said Barclay Crammer. A little cameo part, the management tells me. And that's throwing roses at it. He uttered a short, scornful noise, which Nizel recognized as part of his stock in trade. A voice outside of the passage called, Half hour, please. Half hour, please. I must be off, said Mr. Crammer, sighing heavily. Not made up yet, and I begin this revolting piece. He rose majestically and made a not unimpressive exit. Poor old J.B.'s very disgruntled, said Gardiner in an undertone. He was to play the beaver, and then it was given to Arthur Subonadier. Great heartburning, I assure you, he smiled charmingly. It's a rum life, Nigel, he said. You mean they're rum people, said Nigel. Yes, partly, like children, and terribly, terribly like actors. They run too true to type. You were not so critical in our Trinity days. Don't remind me of my callow youth. Youth, said Alan. You children amuse me. Twenty years ago next month I came down from Oxford. Ah, me. Out upon it. All the same, persisted Nigel. You can't persuade me, Felix, that you are out of conceit with your job. That's another matter, said Felix Gardiner. There was a light tap on the door, which opened far enough to disclose a rather fat face, topped by a check cap and garnished with a red spotted handkerchief. It was accompanied by an unmistakable gust of alcohol, only partially disguised by violet. Hello, hello, Arthur. Come in, said Gardiner, pleasantly, but without any great enthusiasm. So sorry, said the face, unctuously. Thought you were alone, old man. Wouldn't intrude for the world. Rot, said Gardiner. Do come in and shut the door. There's a drought in this room. No, no, it's not important. Just a little matter of, I'll see you later. The face withdrew, and the door was shut very gently. It's Arthur Sir Bonadieu, Gardiner explained to Alan. He's pinched J.B.'s part and thinks I've pinched his. Result, J.B. hates him and he hates me. That's what I mean about actors. Oh, said Nigel, with youthful profundity, jealousy. And whom do you hate? asked Alan lightly. I, Gardiner said. I'm at the top of this particular tree and can afford to be generous. I dare say I'll get like it sooner or later. Do you think Sir Bonadier a good actor? asked Nigel. Gardiner lifted one shoulder. He's Jacob Saint's nephew. I see. Or do I? Jacob Saint owns six theaters, of which this is one. He gives good parts to Sir Bonadier. He never engages poor artists. Therefore, Sir Bonadier must be a good actor. I refuse to be more catty than that. Do you know this play? He said, turning to Alan. No, said the inspector. Not a word of it. I've been trying to discover from your makeup whether you are a hero, a racketeer, one of us police, or all three. The pipe on your dressing table suggests a hero, the revolver a racketeer, and the excellent taste of the coat you are about to put on, a member of my own profession. I deduce, my dear Bathgate, that Mr. Gardiner is a hero disguised as a gunman and a member of the CID. There, said Nigel triumphantly. He turned proudly to Gardiner. For once, Alan was behaving nicely as a detective. Marvelous, said Gardiner. You don't mean to tell me I'm right, said Alan. Not far out. But I use the revolver as a policeman, the pipe as a gunman, and don't wear that suit in this piece at all. Which only goes to show, said Alan, grinning, that intuition is as good as induction any day. They lit cigarettes, and Nigel and Gardner began a long reminiscent yarn about their Cambridge days. The door opened again, and a little dried-up man in an alpaca jacket came in. Ready, Mr. Gardner? he asked, scarcely glancing at the others. Gardner took off his wrap, and the dresser got a coat from under the sheet and helped him into it. 
You need a touch more powder, sir, if I may say so, he remarked. It's a warm night. That gun business all right, asked Gardner, turning back to the mirror. Prop says so. Let me give you a brush, if you please, Mr. Gardner. Oh, get along with you, Nanny, rejoined Gardner. He submitted good-humoredly to the clothes brush. Handkerchief, murmured the dresser, clicking one into the jacket. Pouch in side pocket, pipe. Be right, sir. Right as rain, run along. Thank you, sir. Shall I take the weapon to Mr. Subonadier, sir? Yes, go along to Mr. Subonadier's room. My compliments, and will he join these gentlemen as my guests for supper? He took up the revolver. Certainly, sir, said the dresser, and went out. Bit of a character, that, said, Sir, said Gardner. You will sup with me, won't you? I've asked Sir Bonadier because he dislikes me. It will add piquancy to the dressed crab. Quarter hour, please, quarter hour, said the voice outside. We'd better go round the front, said Nigel. Plenty of time. I want you to meet Stephanie Vaughan, Alan. She's madly keen on criminology and would never forgive me if I hid you. Alan looked politely resigned. Stephanie, Gardner shouted loudly. A muffled voice from beyond the wall sang, Hello? Can I bring visitors in to see you? Of course, darling, trilled the voice, histrionically cordial. Marvelous woman, said Gardner. Let's go. Behind the tarnished star, they found Miss Stephanie Vaughan in a rather bigger room with thicker carpets, larger chairs, a mass of flowers, and an aproned dresser. She received them with much gaiety, gave them cigarettes, and dealt out her charm lavishly, with perhaps an extra libation from Gardner and a hint, thought Nigel, of something more subtly challenging in her manner towards Inspector Allen. Even with blue grease on her eyelids and scarlet grease on her nostrils, she was a very lovely woman with beautifully groomed hair, enormous eyes, and a heart-shaped face. Her three-cornered smile was famous. She began to talk shop, Alan's shop, to the inspector and asked him if he had read H.B. Irving's book on famous criminals. He said he had and thought it jolly good. She asked him if he had read other books on criminals and psychology, if he had read Freud, if he had read Ernest Jones. Mr. Allen said he thought them all jolly good. Nigel felt nervous. I've saturated myself in the literature of crime, said Miss Vaughan. I tried to understand, deep down, the psychology of the criminal. I'm greedy for more. Tell me of more books to read, Mr. Allen. Have you read Edgar Wallace? Asked Allen. He's jolly good. There was a nasty silence, and then Miss Vaughan decided to let loose her lovely laugh. It rang out a glorious, bubbling cascade of joyousness. Gardner and Nigel joined in, the latter unconvincingly. Gardner flung his head back and shouted. He put his hand lightly on Stephanie Vaughan's shoulder. Then, quite suddenly, they were aware that the door had been flung open and that Arthur Subonadier was standing in the room. With one hand, he held on the door. With the other, he fumbled at the spotted neckerchief below his scrubby beard. His mouth was half open, and he seemed to be short of breath. At last he spoke. Quite a jolly little party, he said. His voice was thick, and they saw how his lips trembled. They stopped short in their laughter. Gardner still with his hand on that lovely shoulder, Stephanie Vaughan opened-mouthed and frozen into immobility, rather as though they were posing for a theatrical photograph. They were a quite appalling little silence. Charming picture, said Sir Bonadier, all loving and bright. Mayn't I know the joke? The joke, said Alan quickly, was a bad one mine. The cream of the jest, said Sir Bonadier, is on me. Stephanie will explain it to you. You're the detective, aren't you? Gardiner and Nigel both started talking. Nigel heard himself introduce Alan. Gardiner was saying something about his supper party. Alan had got to his feet and was offering Miss Vaughan a cigarette. She took it without moving her gaze off Sir Bonadier, and Alan lit it for her. I'm sure we ought to go round to the front, he said. Don't let's miss the first scene, Nigel. I can't bear to be late. He took Nigel by the arm and something courteous, said something courteous to Miss Vaughan, shook Gardner's hand, and propelled Nigel towards the door. Don't let me drive you away, said Sir Bonadier, without moving from the doorway. I've come to, I've come to see for the fun. Come, 
came to see Gardner, really, and found him having his fun. Arthur, Stephanie Vaughan spoke for the first time. Well, said Sir Bonadier loudly, I've made up my mind to stop the fun, see? The reason why you shouldn't hear? He turned slightly towards Nigel. You're a journalist, literary man. Here's a surprise. Gardner's a literary man, too. Arthur, you're tight, said Gardner. He moved towards Sir Bonadier, who took a step towards him. Alan seized his chance and shoved Nigel through the door. Goodbye for the moment, he called. See you after the show. And in a second or two, they were back on the stage staring at one another. That was pretty beastly, said Nigel. Yes, said Alan. Come on. The brute's drunk, said Nigel. Yes, said Alan. This way. They crossed the stage and made for the exit door, standing aside to let an elderly woman come in. They heard old Blair say, Evening, Miss Max. And they went out a voice in the passage behind them called, Overture and beginners, please. Overture and beginners, please. Chapter 3, Death of the Beaver. It's amazing to me, said Nigel in the second interval, how that fellow Sir Bonadier can play a part in the state he's in. You'd never guess he was tight now, would you? I think I would have known said Alan. From where we are, you can see his eyes. They, they, they don't quite focus. You'd call it a darn good performance, said Nigel. Yes, murmured Alan. Yes, you've, you've seen the piece before, haven't you? Reviewed it, said Nigel, rather grandly. Has Sir Bonadier's reading of the part altered at all? Nigel turned and stared at his friend. Well, he said slowly, now I come to think of it, I believe it has. It's sort of more intense. I believe in that last scene with Felix, when they were alone on the stage. What is it he says to Felix? Something about getting him. I'll get you, Carruthers, quoted Alan, with an uncannily just rendering of Sir Bonadier's thick voice. I'll get you, just when you least expect it. Good Lord, Alan, what a memory you've got, said Nigel, very startled. Never before seen anything on the stage that impressed me so deeply. All carried away like, give to Nigel, but... Alan refused to laugh. It was uncanny, Alan said. The atmosphere of the dressing room intensified on the stage, intensified and bigger than life, like emotion in a nightmare. And then he said, you think I'm bluffing, playing a part, don't you? And Carruthers, Gardner, you know, said, I think you're bluffing, Beaver, yes. But if you're not, look out. You're a darn good mimic, Inspector. Claptrap stuff it is, really, said Alan uneasily. What's the matter with you? I don't know. I've got the ooble-boobles. Let's have a drink. They went to the bar. The inspector was very silent and read his program. Nigel looked at his curiously. He felt apologetic about the horribly uncomfortable scene in the dressing room and wondered very much what was brewing between Gardner, Sir Bondier, and Miss Vaughan. I suppose old Felix has cut the bounder out, he ventured. Yes, said Alan. Oh, yes, that, of course. The warning bell set up its intolerable racket. Come on, said Alan. Don't let's miss any of it. He fidgeted while Alan finished his drink and led the way back to their stalls. The supper party won't be much fun, I'm afraid, said Nigel. Oh, supper party. Perhaps it'll be off. Perhaps. What'll we do if it's on? Apologize and get out? Wait and see. Helpful suggestion. I don't think the supper party will happen. Here she goes, remarked Nigel as the lights slowly died away, leaving the auditorium in thick, populated darkness. At the bottom of the blackness in front of them, a line of light appeared. It widened and in silence so complete that the sound of the pulleys could be heard. The curtain rose on the last act of the rat and the beaver. It opened with a scene between the beaver, Sir Bonadier, his cast-off mistress, Janet Emerald, and her mother, Susan Max. They were all involved in the opium trade. One of their number has been murdered. They had suspected him of being a stool pigeon in the employ of Carruthers, alias the Rat, Felix Gardner. Miss Emerald threatened. Miss Max sniveled. Sir Bonadier snarled. He took a revolver from his pocket and loaded it while they watched him significantly. What are you going to do? whispered Janet Emerald. Pay a little visit to Mr. Carruthers. The stage was blacked out for a quick change. Carruthers, Felix Gardner, 
was discovered in his library among the leather chairs that Nigel and Alan had seen from the wings. It was still uncertain to all but the wariest playgoer whether he was the infamous rat, organizer of illicit drug traffic, agent of the Nazis, enemy of the people, or the heroic savant of the British Secret Service. He sat at his desk and rapped out a letter on the typewriter, the keyboard of which was not visible. He pounds away at the letter Q, whispered Nigel, full of inside knowledge. To Gardner came Jennifer, Stephanie Vaughn, passionately in love with him, believing him false, fascinated in spite of her nobler self by the famous Felix charm. Miss Vaughn did this sort of thing remarkably well. The audience was enchanted, especially at any moment the bookcase might slide back, revealing the butler, J. Barclay Crammer, whom they knew to be a gunman of gunmen. It was, as Nigel had remarked in reviewing the play, a generous helping out of the old stockpot, but Felix Gardner and Stephanie Vaughn played it with subtlety and restraint. The lines were sophisticated if the manner was melodramatic, and it went. Even when the sliding bookcase slid, and the gunman did seize Miss Vaughn by her lovely elbows and pinion her. He did it, as it were, on the turn of an epigram, since as well as being a butler and a gunman, he was also an Etonian. Miss Vaughn was borne off registering a multitude of conflicting emotions, and Felix Gardner remained wrapped in the closest inscrutability. He took out his pipe, filled and lit it, and gave a little audible sigh and sank into one of the leather chairs. Isn't he marvelous? breathed the woman's voice from behind Nigel. Nigel smiled a superior but tolerant smile and glanced at Alan. The inspector's dark eyes were fixed on the stage. Positively, thought Nigel, more tolerant than ever. Positively, old Alan's all head up. Then he saw Alan's eyebrow, jer eyebrow jerk up and his lips tighten and he himself turned to the stage and experienced an emotional shock. So Bonadier, in his character of the beaver, was standing in the upstage entrance facing the audience. With one hand held on the door, and with the other, he fumbled with his spotted neckerchief below his scrubby beard. His mouth was half open, and he seemed to be short of breath. At last he spoke. So complete was the duplication of the scene in the dressing room that Nigel expected to hear him repeat quite a jolly little party, and got another shock when he said very softly, So the rat's in his hole at last. Beaver, whispered Felix Gardner. It was a line that most actors would have played for a laugh. Few actors could have played it otherwise, but Felix Gardner did. He made it sound horrible. The beaver came down stage. His right hand now held a revolver. You're not a killer, rat, he said. I am. Put him up. Gardner's hands went slowly above his head. Sir Bonadier patted him all over, still covering him with the gun. Then he backed away. He began to arraign Gardner. The intensity of his fury, repressed and controlled, apparently by the most stringent effort, touched the audience like venom. The emotional contact between the players in the house was tightened to an almost unendurable tension. Nigel felt profoundly uncomfortable. It seemed to him that this was no fustian scene between the rat and the beaver, but a development of the antagonism of two men, indecently played out in public. Carruthers, the rat, was his friend Felix Gardner, and Beaver was Arthur Subondier, who hated him. The whole business was beastly, and he would have liked to look away from it, but for the life of him he couldn't do so. Round every corner, rat, you've waited for me, Sir Bonadier was saying now. Every job I've done this last year, rat, you've mucked around my girl. His voice rose hysterically. I've had enough. I'm through. I've come to finish it. By God, I've come to finish you. Not this evening, beaver. It's a lovely little plan, and I hate to spoil your party, but you see we're not alone. What are you saying? We're not alone, Gardner spoke with the exasperating facetiousness of the popular hero. There's a good angel watching over you, beaver. You're covered, my beaver. Do I look easy? You look lovely, my beaver, but if you don't believe me, take a step to your right, 
and glance in the mirror behind me, and I think you'll see the image of the angel that's watching you. Monsieur Bonadier moved upstage. His right hand still held the revolver leveled at Gardner. But for a second, he shifted his gaze to the mirror above Gardner's head. Then slowly he turned and stared at the upstage entrance. A moment, and Stephanie Vaughn stood in the doorway. She too held a revolver, pointed at Sir Bonadier. Jenny, whispered Sir Bonadier. He dropped his hand, and the barrel of the gun shone blue. It hung limply from his fingers, and as though in a dream, he let Gardner take it from him. Thank you, Jennifer, said Gardner. Miss Vaughn, with a little laugh, lowered her gun. You don't have any luck, do you, Beaver? She said. Sir Bonadier offered a, uttered a curious little whinnying sound, turned and clawed at Gardner's neck, forcing up to his chin. Gardner's hand jerked up. The report of the revolver, anticipated by every nerve in the audience, was deafeningly loud. Sir Bonadier crumpled up and, turning a face that was blank of every expression but that of profound astonishment, fell in a heap at Gardner's feet. So far, the acting honors in the scene had been even, but now Felix Gardner surpassed anything that had gone before. He stood looking foolishly at the gun in his hand and then let it fall to the floor. He turned, bewildered, and peering at the audience as though asking a question. He looked at the stage exits as if he med meditated an escape. Then he gazed at Stephanie Vaughn, who, in her turn, was looking with horror from him to what he had done. When at last he spoke and his lips moved once or twice before any words were heard, it was with the voice of an automaton. Miss Vaughn replied like an echo. They spoke as though they were talking machines. Gardner kept his gaze fixed on the revolver. Once he made as if he would pick it up, but drew his hand back as though it were untouchable. God, that man can act, said a voice behind Nigel. He woke up to feel Alan's hand on his knee. Is this the end? The inspector whispered. Yes, said Nigel. The curtain comes down in a moment. Then let's get out. What? Let's get out, repeated Alan, and then, with a change of voice, are you looking for me? Their seats were on the aisle. Glancing up, Nigel saw that an usher was bending over his friend. Are you Inspector Allen, sir? Yes, you want me? I'll come. Get up back. Completely at a loss, Nigel rose and followed Allen and the usher up the aisle into the foyer and out by a sort of office to the stage door alley. No one spoke until then when the usher said, It's terrible, sir. It's terrible. Quite, said Allen coldly. I know. I know. Did you guess, sir? Have they, have they all guessed? I don't think so. Is someone going to ask for a doctor? Not that there's any hurry for that. My God, sir, is he dead? Of course he's dead. As they approached the stage door, old Blair came running out, wringing, wringing his hands. Alan walked past him, followed by Nigel. A man in a dinner jacket, his face very white, came down the passage. Inspector Allen, he said. Here, said Alan, is the curtain down? I don't think so. Shall I go out in front and ask for a doctor? We didn't realize. I, I didn't stop the show. Nobody realized. They, they don't know in front, and I don't think they know in front. He said we ought to send for you. The man gabbled on madly. They reached the wings just as the curtain came down. Stephanie Vaughn and Gardner were still on stage. The applause from the auditorium broke like a storm of hail. Simpson, the stage manager, darted out of the prompt corner. As soon as the fringe of the curtain touched the stage, Miss Vaughn screamed and hurled her arms round Gardner's neck. Simpson held back the curtain, looking with horror at Sir Bonadier, who lay close to his feet. The man in evening dress, who was the business manager, stepped through. The orchestra blared out the first note of the national anthem, but the man must have held up his hand or spoken to them, because the noise of the one note petered out foolishly. On the stage, they heard the business manager speaking to the audience. If there is a doctor in front, will he kindly come round to the stage door? Thank you. The orchestra again struck up the national anthem. Behind the curtain, Alan spoke to Simpson. Go to the street door and stop anyone from leaving. No one is to go out, you understand? Bathgate, find a telephone and get the yard. Tell them from me what has happened and ask them to send the usual people. Say I'll want constables. 
He turns to the business manager who had come through the curtain. Show Mr. Bathgate the way to the nearest telephone and then come back here. He knelt down by Sir Bondier. The business manager glanced at Nigel. Where's the telephone? Asked Nigel. Yes, of course, said the business manager. I'll, I'll show you. They went together through a door in the proscenium that led to the auditorium, almost colliding with the tall man in the tailcoat. I'm the doctor, he said. What's it all about? On the stage, said Nigel. If you'll go through. The doctor glanced at him and went on to the stage. In the auditorium, the last stragglers were still finding their way out. Some women with their heads together stood with bundles of dust sheets in their arms. Get on with your work, said the business manager savagely. My name's Stately, Mr. Mr. Bathgate, said Nigel. Yes, of course. This is a terrible business, Mr. Bathgate. No one, thought Nigel, seems to be able to say anything but this. They crossed the foyer into an office. People were still standing about the entrance when the woman said, You're not very clever about taxis, are you, darling? Nigel, at the telephone, remembered the yard number. A man's voice answered him very quickly. I'm speaking for Chief Detective Inspector Allen, said Nigel. There's been an incident at the Unicorn, a, a fatal accident. He wants you to send the usual people and constables at once. Very good, said the voice. Did you say fatal accident? Yes, said Nigel. I think so, and I think... He stopped, gulped, and then his voice seemed to add of its own accord. I think it looks like murder. That's the end of chapter three. I think that's a, a fun place to, uh, uh, to stop. Uh, yeah, I feel like pacing wise for a murder mystery, this one starts very, very well. Uh, what do we got going on in the chat? Uh, I can kind of see some chat. Uh, yeah, anyway, what I like about this book is uh, we, we meet all these characters who all have a reason for disliking this guy, the, the victim. And we know the victim is a bit of a hothead and a bit of a weirdo. This woman doesn't want to marry him. These actors don't like him. Uh, his uncle doesn't like him, but we, we, we're, we know somebody is going to get murdered because the author foreshadows by saying inspector Allen then unknowingly stepped into what would be the, one of the hardest jobs of his career. And, uh, yeah. So we, we know somebody is going to be murdered, but the, uh, the story plays with us and, uh, surprises us by announcing who gets murdered. I like it. Uh, we, we don't really know. You, you basically, you start a murder mystery with the crime is how you start it. Middle of the mystery is the most important part. The ending is, uh, the ending is really the who cares part. Who did it? Who cares? Uh, I mean, you want to find out obviously, but, uh, that's why you read the whole thing, but it's the middle that's important. And I like just how much, uh, I don't know, it all comes down to when you're, when you're writing a mystery, how much of a beginning is there? How much do we know of the victim? So in a, in a modern mystery, a modern thriller, you're going to usually start with a murder in like the first three pages in something of a prologue chapter. And uh, you just be spectacular and show offy about it. Uh, a weaker author or a uh, kind of a pulpier author might have started this mystery. There were plenty of pulp mystery writers at this time uh, in the 30s and 40s. Uh, a pulpier writer would have started with a murder the inspector comes in, uh, and then he talks to all the people, and we learn who the victim was afterward. Because uh, you want to start with this scene that's sensational, this this setup where somebody loaded a real bullet into this prop gun or switched. No, it was a it was a real gun, but uh, 
it wasn't loaded at all. It was not loaded with blanks. It was, uh, there was another gun off stage that would be fired. So someone had loaded the gun or, you know, what, what happened? Who wanted to kill this guy? And, you know, I, I like, uh, it's not a perfect storm of, of potential killers the way some mysteries are uh it's uh everyone has like sort of a reason to not everyone has a has like sort of a reason to not like this guy but uh not uh nobody really has a reason to kill him at least not that we can see so i mean it's, uh, they, they could be hating this guy because of the nepotism, literally the nepotism, uh, his, uh, that he is the nephew, nephewism, uh, that the uncle, uh, maybe the uncle is trying to do it. That's my, that was my first guess. The first time I read the book was that it's obviously the uncle because the uncle is the one he blackmails. Um, so what, what is it really? Really good setup. Very, very good setup. And uh, it's kind of a hard story to try to read out loud because we have all the players there at the beginning. And uh, when, when you get into the investigation phase of the murder, you're going to be dealing with the inspector, talking to people one at a time in smaller groups. But it has that, that tight, dense party atmosphere at the beginning. I like that. A lot of... Uh, Murder mysteries would, uh, you know, it'd be the, the, the dinner party mystery. The, uh, somebody dies at a dinner party. One of my favorite films, Gosford Park. It's like that. Um, it's kind of a send up of that whole genre of story. Uh, however, with, uh, I mean, that was, that was the lazy go to murder mystery. Then you get Agatha Christie writing, uh, Murder on the Orient Express, where everybody on the train is a suspect. That one has a very good, uh, a very good plot twist. So it's, it's everybody's on a train, and this it's uh, uh, I don't know. One of the things that Naomi Marsh did is she wrote a lot about plays and theater. There's a lot of these weird theatrical themed mysteries that she wrote. So people who are actors who play characters for a living, therefore it's a little bit more interesting. Why these people keep killing each other? You know who knows, but uh, I like it. And, uh, I think maybe that's, uh, that's enough. Uh, will I read the rest of this book on a stream? Probably not. I'll probably just read the rest of this book myself, but if you want to find it, there it is. Very good book. Uh, Naomi Marsh wrote many books, so maybe you can find some of them and read them. Hey, I'm going to go to bed now. That's what I'm going to do. Good night.